All right. Well, good morning and good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants event. My name is Joe Grabowski, and I'll be your host for today. If this is your first time joining us, a huge welcome, especially to all those virtual teachers out there with your classrooms. We're all about bringing science, adventure, exploration, and conservation live into classrooms across North America and beyond. So each month we can host anywhere from 40, 50, even 60 live uh, events for classrooms. So if you head to exploringbytheseat.com, you can see all the events coming up. We've got a jam-packed May uh, as per usual, but we've got some really great events uh, to wrap up April. We've been doing a few events uh, with NOAA in the Office of National Marine Sanctuary. So uh, it wasn't too long ago uh, when we had our first connection from the Olympic Coast um, National Marine Sanctuary, and we have a really great one in store for everyone today. So we're going to be doing a little California streaming today. We're going to explore deep sea coral and sponge assemblages in sunny Southern California. So we're going to be joined by Lizzie Duncan. She's a research ecologist and West Coast Deep Sea Coral Initiative Coordinator. We're also going to be joined by Lisa Unick. She is a policy coordinator with NOAA's Office of National Marine Sanctuaries. She's a West Coast region uh, in the West Coast region. And we're going to learn about scientists uh, who are taking us to the magnificent deep sea coral and sponge communities in multiple areas. So we're going to check out the Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuary, the Santa uh, Lucia Bank, and the escarpment in the proposed uh, Chamash Heritage Nat National Marine Sanctuary. So I am going to bring in our first speaker. We have the amazing Lisa joining us. Let's bring her in. Hey, Lisa, how are you doing today? Good, good, great, great to be here, and good morning, everybody, or good afternoon. Yeah, excellent. Well, I can see we've got tons of comments already coming in via YouTube. So I want to remind everybody there to use that to introduce yourself, introduce your classes, and then save that space for questions. We want to make sure we can find the questions nice and easy when the time comes. And of course, a big shout out to all of our, our classrooms joining us in camera spots. We'll be working in some of their questions live. But Lisa, I'm going to let you take over. Let's let's do, get doing a little streaming. Great. So thank you all of you who are joining us this morning or afternoon, wherever you are from. And uh, we are really excited to share with you some exploration and discoveries that we did last October using the exploration of vessel Nautilus that uh, you will see right here up on the screen. This is a 211 foot ship. Um, we did our explorations from this ship and I would sh will share with you how we did that because we sort of did it the same way as we're discussing with you now, we did it virtually. And um, the way that the exploration vessel Nautilus brings uh, discovery and exploration to the world is they use virtual uh, telepresence. And basically what they do is they have the ship that you can see up there on the left hand, right hand corner. It has tethered to it these uh, robotic vehicles, these ROVs, remotely operated vessels that go down into the ocean, sometimes very deep. Um, and they broadcast imagery, video imagery and that then gets sent from a satellite dish up to the satellites, then goes to a substation, then it goes to the inner space center where it then gets broadcasted via the internet to classrooms. So hopefully some of you were able to participate in the discoveries that we uh, did last October um, using this exploration vessel Nautilus. And the EV Nautilus is run by Ocean Exploration Trust. And you'll be hearing us use OET or Ocean Exploration Trust many times throughout this presentation. So who are we? We are the Office of National Marine Sanctuaries. We manage and explore in our National Marine Sanctuaries, which are a type of underwater park. And hopefully some of you have been able to visit our national marine sanctuaries or you've been able to visit a national park. And just as national parks on land protect maybe redwood forests, what national marine sanctuaries do is they protect sea um, features like kelp forest or coral, coral reefs. And we have 14 national marine sanctuaries around the nation. We also have two national marine monuments. I love saying that we have one in the Pacific Islands called Papahanaumokuakea, practicing that. 
and Rose Atoll. And then we also have two uh, sanctuaries that are being designated in the Great Lakes. So we also have national marine sanctuaries in the Great Lakes. They're not just in salt waters. And um, what we did uh, last um, October is we, um, we explored along the West Coast. And you can see, as Joe said, we explored in Olympic Coast, but also Greater Farallons National Marine Sanctuary, Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary, and Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuary. And in between, you can see that we have a place called the Santa Lucia Bank. And this is an area that we hope will one day be designated as a national marine sanctuary, but right now it's nominated to become a national marine sanctuary. And it was nominated by the Northern uh, Chumash Tribal Council, which is a, an indigenous people group, tribal entity here in California. And they want to protect this area for to protect their sacred sites and some of the wonderful underwater features that we will hopefully that we will be sharing with you today. So, how did we really do this last year? Um, because it was COVID, and during COVID operations, the Nautilus crew could not have all of the science team on board. We had to, as scientists, the entire science team was at home, and um, we conducted our operations just like how we're doing right now. We were working from our own um, home offices while the operations team, which includes like the ROV pilots, the navigators, the people that run the ship, we'll talk a little bit more about the different uh, positions on a ship um, to, to run this type of operation, but they were all on the ship. While the entire science team made up of um, our science team for the exploration of Santa Lucia Bank and um, Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuary was at least 15 people. We didn't all work at the same time. We had different watches and watches means that we were then on deck, if you will, to, um, to, be, uh, to guide the discovery. And um, I had the watch lead from midnight to four. So I was exploring by the seat of my pajama pants sometimes just to, um, you know, I would just roll out of bed and then um, get in front of my monitors and start exploring. As the imagery was coming in, I was guiding the exploration. And we also had many scientists from around the world participating and they could participate via a, an internet chat room. And similar to how we have an internet chat room during this um, Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants um, event. So the um, folks from the Office of National Marine Sanctuaries that participated in our explorations are, you can see myself up there, and then Lizzie will be joining the room shortly, but also our educators, Laura Francis and Julie Bursek and Chris Caldo. And we also, as I said, had at least another 10 scientists from the uh, National Marine Fisheries Service who were helping us with the exploration and then we had um, a number of scientists who would participate with us via the chat room who were following along with the exploration. And we would be um, texting with them back and forth, trying to get their advice on what we were seeing. Because in some of this exploration that we did, we were seeing some animals and organisms that we had never seen before or that we were not very familiar with. And we needed their input to help guide uh, what we would do as part of the exploration. So I think Lizzie, you're up now. So here's Lizzie Duncan. She was my co-cruise leader and we had a great time working together doing this also remotely. She She's in uh, Santa Barbara and I'm up here in uh, the Santa Cruz area. can't hear you, Lizzie. Yeah, Lizzie, I think you're still on mute. Thank you. I can't tell you how many times that's happened to me. <laughs> um, thank you, Lisa, for that great intro um, and all that wonderful background information. Um, I'm going to take over for a little bit and talk to you about some of the technology we used and um, how we go about this exploration of these really remote ecosystems. 
So the photo that you're seeing now um, is an example of how we do mapping um, in the deep sea. It's used these, these sonar or acoustic signals that it sends down to the seafloor, and then it kind of measures how quickly they come back to get an idea of the depth. And you can see, um, you can distinguish interesting seafloor features in that way. And to be able to safely send down these remotely operated vehicles, we have to have an understanding kind of of what the, the bottom of the ocean looks like. Um, so as far as these remotely operated vehicles, Ocean Exploration Trust has two ROVs that they use to explore the seafloor. Um, they also do that mapping like I had just said. Um, so Argus in the top right hand corner is a smaller um, ROV that keeps a watchful eye on Hercules. And Hercules, as you can see um, in the two bottom pictures, is pretty much the ROV in action. And so it has these manipulator arms that we can use to sample. It has a number of different cameras on it. Um, so we're able to look at um, what's going on around us. So we're not bumping in anything. And so we can just safely um, operate in this remote system. And so for the people, uh, we have so many people involved. Um, like Lisa was saying, we have the scientists at home, um, but on the ship to help us guide these uh, missions, we have the navigator who is often talking to the bridge or the pilot of the EV Nautilus, um, telling them in steps, we'd like to go north 10 meters or so. So they're slowly following the ROV as we're exploring the bottom of the ocean because we're tethered together. Um, and so that they kind of coordinate with the ship so we can move in synchrony. There are the pilots, of course. So Hercules and Argus have their own pilots. And I also believe when Hercules is sampling, they have an additional person that just controls the manipulator arm to pick up samples. We also have video engineers on board. Um, they help us um, coordinate all the cameras on the ROV so we can safely see around us while also zooming in so we can identify deep sea corals, sponges, fishes, and other associates. Um, and so they just keep track of the video. They're also doing the recording. We also have a data logger on board who is taking notes, um, kind of annotating what's going on as it happens, logging the coordinates, so where we are in space and time, and logging if we have any issues, um, technical issues on board. Um, normally, um, when it's not, you know, during a global pandemic, we also have a, um, a, a communications person that helps relay information from the public or questions that the public has. Um, so we can use that telepresence system to answer questions in real time. Um, but due to the limited number of people on board for everyone's safety, we did not have that this year. Um, and then, of course, as we've been talking about, we have the scientists. Um, so although we weren't on board, Normally, you can see in these photos, um, we're all sitting in this control van on the ship, and we have a number of different screens on board, um, and so we can really talk to each other through our, our headsets, but also lean over and ask questions and that kind of thing. So it was a bit trickier this year, but we were able to make it work. But we also have a number of other people that help us. Um, it includes the deck crew, engineers, geological scientists, communication specialists, and, and so many more people. It's, it surely takes a village to make this happen. Um, and I believe we have um, a video of the ROV being launched, um, which Joe will queue up next. So you can kind of see um, on the deck of the ship how we go from um, preparing the ROV to actually lifting it up and putting it in the water. So this is the back deck of the EV Nautilus, and this is the ROV Hercules. Um, it's being lifted up by a crane. And you can see a number of the different cameras, the electronics on board, the two manipulator arms that are on each side. And right there in that shot, you can also see um, some Niskin bottles. Those are those gray tubes, which we'll be talking about a bit later, and that's how we sample water. So this is being launched at night. Um, so extra safety and precautions are being taken to launch safely, which depends on the sea state. So how wavy is it? How windy is it? Um, as you can imagine, that heavy of an ROV being swung on a tether is um, kind of precarious sometimes. And so as Hercules is um, 
gently um, deposit it into the water. They turn the lights on and that's when the ROV pilots immediately start driving it and they kind of drive it away from the ship um, and they let out the line and then they'll launch Argus after that and then they're on their way. Great, thanks Joe. Um, so as I said, Argus is keeping a watchful eye on Hercules. Um, as you said, we have the main camera, we have those um, water sampling bottles. Um, and so they're triggered to sample water um, by the manipulator arm pulls a little string. There's so many different sensors on the ROV to measure oxygen concentration, the acidity, um, and the, the temperature, of course. And then we'll see a little bit later when we show some highlight reels. Um, when we gather these samples, we can, there's a drawer on the front of the, the ROV where we organize our samples so we can keep them separate when they get up to the surface. Um, and there's also a number of ways to sample the geology. So the sediment, um, rocks and those kinds of things. We can see the upper corner is the manipulator arm holding a scoop so we can scoop sediment and other organisms. And um, the, the image below that is actually a device that the manipulator arm is holding to softly um, gather different kinds of samples, because um, you can imagine um, a metal arm may not be the most gentle at collecting certain kinds of samples. And what were we doing out there and why? We had a number of different scientific objectives, um, one being uh, collect visual transects. So if we're trying to quantify or you know, count organisms and we're trying to determine their density or how many of them are in within a certain space, um, we, steep, we keep on a straight line. These are called transects. They're roughly 200 meters um, where we keep a fixed direction. We're only about three feet off the seafloor um, and we continue that for about 15 minutes. Um, so we were doing a number of those to kind of characterize um, the different habitats on the seafloor. And of course, we collected some samples of sponges, corals, and other invertebrates. Um, when possible, we only take a tiny piece so we don't um, harm the corals or sponges or other things that we're sampling um, and only when there's multiple of them so we're not taking the only special one that we find. We also use the ROV cameras to collect what we're calling photo mosaics, which is um, processing together a number of different images so you can render a three-dimensional model later. Um, and an example of that is the lower left-hand photo um, from the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary, where they collected a photo mosaic of a whale fall. And I believe if you're tuning in to the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary, explore by the seat of your pants, um, they'll be talking about that then. Um, we also use this imagery in these videos to validate new information that we've collected. So as I was talking about mapping, so we could see what the bottom of the seafloor looks like, we can send down the ROVs to make sure that what we're getting is true. Is it hard bottom? Is it soft bottom? What does this canyon look like? Um, and there's also models that scientists create to try to predict where deep sea corals and sponges live. Um, and that's the bottom right hand corner image where the warmer colors indicate a higher number of deep sea corals and sponges that are in that area. And the cooler, like the pink colors, are predicting fewer. And because this technology takes a lot of effort, it takes a lot of money, it takes a lot of time, you can imagine only a very small percentage of the seafloor has been um, explored to this date. And so those models can help us target where we want to go um, to see what we can find. And then I'm going to give it back to Lisa because she's going to be talking more about uh, the Santa Lucia Bank escarpment exploration that she was guiding. Hi, I'm back. So the area that we were exploring is called the Santa Lucia Bank. And um, you can see here a map. It's a map of the sea floor and it's showing the different depths and the orange color means less deep and down to purple is very deep. And Santa Lucia Bank covers an area from uh, two miles down up to 400 meters from the surface. And you can see this map shows some locations that we had planned to do our ROV dives on. We were only able to go to four of these squares that you see on the map. 
because of weather and there were also some um, equipment failures. But having four dives down to a, a minimum of, um, of uh, two miles is still pretty exciting. And um, we were able to collect 60, 64 hours of video, collect number of samples of sponges and corals, also to do some timed transects so that we can do some quantitative or numbers of, of or using you know, math and numbers to figure out how many animals and organisms are down there. We also were able to get one photo mosaic and so that we can um, better uh, share with classrooms like yours what a deep sea coral or sponge looks like. And the reason we were looking at the Santa Lucia Bank area was because, as I told you, this area was nominated or has been nominated to be a national marine sanctuary by the Northern Chumash Tribal Council. And you can see a photo there in the bottom of the Chumash with their traditional canoes that they use to cross um, to the Channel Islands. And the Chumash have a very special connection with the ocean. When you hear about their origin stories, their ancestors in those stories are dolphins. And uh, they have a very special connection to the ocean that they've had for a millennia. So some of the things that we discovered on Santa Lucia Bank, this is from a dive where we went down to 1600 meters, about a mile. And a lot of what we see when we were uh, exploring around Santa Lucia Bank is this sort of fractured rock. And on one hand, when you're looking for uh, deep sea corals and sponges, you're looking for rock, hard bottom. Uh, corals and sponges like to settle and grow on bottom that's stable, not sand or mud that moves in the currents. So when we were planning the dive, we selected areas that through that mapping that um, Lizzie was telling you about would have hard substrate, but we weren't really sure what kind of hard substrate would it be. And so as you can see from some of these pictures, a lot of it was this fractured rock, which isn't a surprise in a way because the Santa Lucia Bank area isn't a very seismically active area. And that just means that there are a lot of underwater earthquakes that happen in the area, breaking up the rock. So corals and sponges like to be on stable rock. So you can see in these photos that we didn't really find a lot of corals and sponges as you will see in some of the um, pictures that we will show you later. But corals and sponges, they will attract other animals. And you can see in some of, in the picture on the right hand corner, there's a crab sitting on a type of sponge called Ferrea. And you will hear Lizzie talk about this Ferrea sponge and what we discovered in Channel Islands when she talks about those discoveries. So here you see um, some other pictures of sponges and corals that we um, found on Santa Lucia Bank. This was an area that we selected because we knew it would have very steep features. And in this area, we did find large corals and sponges. And you can see uh, the middle photo on the bottom, that's called a bubble gum cor coral. And I bet you can all imagine why we call it the bubble gum coral. And hopefully, uh, or in the video that you will see, you'll see some close-ups of this bubble gum coral. They, it's pink and um, it really looks like bubble gum. And they um, attract also some crabs. And uh, we were very happy to see that Santa Lucia Bank also um, support some of these large coral and sponge communities and as we found here at the False Scarp. We also um, explored very, very deep. As I told you, we went down to at least two, two miles to uh, 3,800 meters. What's really great about the Ocean Exploration Trust and their ROVs is that they have this capability to go this deep. It's the only vehicles that we know of that can go this deep. We've partnered with other people or other organizations that have ROVs and they typically can go only to 500 meters or a thousand meters, but the Hercules or Argus can go down to 3,000, 4,000 meters. And when you go this deep, you find 
some of the animals that live in the deepest parts of the ocean, such as in the upper left-hand corner, you can see a type of octopus, and this is called the Dumbo octopus. I'm sure you can imagine why we call it the Dumbo octopus. And these are the octopus that live in the deepest oceans. We also have a, trying to think of the name of that animal, the white fish. It's called a, I'm sorry, the name escapes me right now. Um, sorry, it'll come back to me, but it's, this is one of the deeper living fishes. Uh, they, as you can see, they have small eyes. They have a body that has like a snake-like tail. Um, you can also see in the left-hand uh, bottom corner, that is called a coleolus, and it's a tethered tunicate. And these are animals that are tethered to the bottom. They lift themselves up off the bottom, and they filter in water. And I think that these are just amazingly looking creatures. They look like horse heads with a visor. And we also um, visited a very shallow area to look at Petrali sole, which is a flatfish. And we had, uh, from previous explorations in the area, we had a suspicion that these flatfish were coming together in the fall. And we were there in October in the fall to um, spawn to create um, offspring. And what we found was indeed, they were coming together in aggregations and they were basically sitting on top of each other like dinner plates. And we called these Petrali uh, sole um, aggregations, cuddle puddles, like they were coming together to make love. So um, I think those are my slides about our discoveries and the highlights. And oh, one last thing, I'm sorry. Unfortunately, some of the things that we see um, when we're um, discovering, even at these very, very deep depths of the ocean is we find a lot of trash. And so you can see in the top um, right-hand corner, that's a can. I think it's a can that maybe carried some um, engine oil or maybe a paint can that probably inadvertently fell off of a vessel or off of a ship, but now it's at the bottom of the ocean and it's it, it's there and it's gonna be there for a long time. But in some ways it also becomes a place that for other animals to sort of aggregate on and to, to live on. And we also have a video coming up next <clears throat> to show some of those um, highlights that Lisa just talked about. This is an example of how we sample. So this is um, the suction hose that we're using to sample kelp um, because one of the scientists wanted to see if kelp and its sticky mucus is going to be a, um, bring down microplastics to the deep sea. And what you're also seeing is what we were calling the bio box, which is on a sled in the front of the ROV that slides out and in to keep our samples safe. These are more images from the Santa Lucia Bank. And as Lisa was mentioning, there are a number of really large corals here um, and places that were never before seen by human eyes. And so it was great to see that such large corals can be growing here. Um, and it takes hundreds, if not thousands of years uh, to reach these sizes. This is the bubblegum coral, a nice close up of those nice polyps, which is what they used to feed. And this is another example of a sampling a coral. Um, as I mentioned, we only take a very small piece um, so we can do genetic work on it and see how they're related to other corals. Um, and especially within a region, how connected are they with other populations? And so this manipulator has a jaw on it that can cut a small piece of coral off and then be placed in the bio box like you just saw. So we only take a small snippet to preserve the coral, which will grow back. Um, 
and we'll take a nice zoom in. So this particular coral doesn't look as fluffy because the polyps, which are its feeding structures, are tucked in. There we are. So you can see how they're tucked in there and all those little bumps are where the polyp would come out to feed. And these are just a couple clips coming up next to show you what other um, organisms that we saw, uh, because it's not all just corals and sponges that we're interested in, but the organisms that associate with these kinds of habitat types. And you can see an, a mother octopus here actually brooding some eggs, which you can see in the lower left-hand corner. Um, so yeah, so those were just a few examples and highlights from the Siena Lucia Bank area. Um, and then I'm going to take over again, and we'll talk about what we found in the Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuary. Um, and so you can see a map of our sanctuary in the Santa Barbara Channel in the Southern California area um, on the right. And we were able to complete seven dives. Um, the weather in the sea states in our region tend to be much calmer than the Santa Lucia Bank area, and so we, we were able to complete more dives here. We took almost 100 hours of video which analysts will review um, and take notes on to see what we, um, what we came across in terms of species of coral, sponge, um, invertebrates, as well as fish. And we took a number of other uh, samples as well. Um, I'm going to go through these pictures a little quickly because I want to get to the video, but um, we saw a number of different magnific magnificent species, including rockfish in the lower left-hand corner, um, which this is in an MPA, and so it was exciting to see the size and the number of fish that are living in here. It lets us know that we're protecting the right places. And you can see in the upper left-hand corner that fish really associate with um, corals and sponges um, as a form of habitat. We also saw a number of other corals. Um, so in the upper left-hand corner, this one is known as Lophelia. And this coral is one of our only reef forming corals, uh, meaning it, it has a skeleton and it can grow on itself, um, creating more 3D structures. Um, but you can also see in the pictures um, on the right hand corner, those two with the arrows pointing at them. Um, sometimes the water is so acidic that as they grow, they kind of crumble. And so it makes these really large piles of pieces of coral and so if you see these piles, you know to look up because there's likely Lophelia growing on an overhang just above. We also explored an area in a different MPA where we saw many more corals and sponges at really high densities. So this means there were a lot in a very small area and they also tended to be pretty large, which, meant, which means that they've been growing for some time and they were able to reach these sizes. Here are some more examples, and then you'll see more um, in the video um, that I'll be queuing up next after this slide. Um, and, it's, and it's interesting to think that at the bottom of the ocean, which is one of you know, the darkest places on our planet, that when you shine a light down there, it's actually extremely colorful and vibrant. And so these communities are really important to um, our fisheries and um, just the human population in general. Okay, and we'll see more of these in the video. So if you can queue up the next video, um, these are some of the, the highlights from the Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuary. So this is more um, of that area within one of the um, NPAs, the Footprint Marine Reserve. And like I said, some of these, these sponges are growing so large and it takes them a very long time to do this because of how cold and nutrient limited these deep, um, these deep waters are. But you can see there's a number of sponges, there's some sea fans at the top that look like that kind of gray color. And that the large yellow sponge that kind of looks like the opening of a trumpet is known as a honeycomb sponge. There's a number of other organisms like crinoids, which are those sea stars. Um, that you see, and this is a video of that Lophelia coral I was just showing you photos of. And you can notice in the background, there's a number of fish swimming around in 
they're probably a little bit confused by the ROV Hercules and all the lights <laughs> since they're adapted to such a dark environment. Um, and you can see the, the kind of pinkish color is the polyps, which is what they're feeding with. And then to the left, you can see the rubble that's forming underneath these corals as they crumble when they, when they age and they're exposed to more acidic water. A lot of these fish are rockfish. Um, the fish in the center of the screen now is known as a lingcod. And these are a number of other coral species um, in the same marine protected area. Um, and they, they're all oriented, if you can tell, in the same direction, which is into the current. And so these flat, large, almost like baseball glove looking corals orient themselves in a way that maximizes the, the water that they're filter feeding through um, to maximize how much food they're getting. You can see another lingcod that might be a predation event <laughs> occurring off screen. And probably the most exciting discovery in the Channel Island Sanctuary is what you're looking at now. Um, this is a huge, expansive mound of dead glass sponges. So unlike other species of sponges, that when they die, they kind of just dissolve into the water, glass sponges have a skeleton that fuses together and it remains after the sponge dies. And so these are all of the skeletons of sponges from some time past. We do not know why um, or how these sponges died, but you can see their hard skeletons are providing habitat for other sponges in some of these clams and scallops and crinoids, which are these feather stars. Um, we have um, a skate there. And then as we were continuing to look at these um, mounds, which went for thousands and thousands of meters, we found a partially living portion of this, this, these sponge mounds. And so those fluffy balls that you were seeing at the end were the species that formed, that were most likely forming those big mounds. Um, and a lot of this research is done in partnership. And so without a lot of our partners, because it can be so costly and resource extensive, um, we wouldn't have been able to do it without them. So as Lisa mentioned, we had a number of scientists help us remotely um, from the National Marine Fishery Service, um, the Santa Barbara Museum of Natural History, uh, we have the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, USGS, and a number of um, academic partners as well. And we couldn't have done it, of course, without the Exploration Trust. And so I think we have time now for questions. All right. Well, I'm going to come back in here. We have one more uh, little surprise to add in here. We have uh, Julie Burstick joining us as well. She's the team lead for education and outreach for the Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuary. So we really do have the question and answer dream team here. I'm pretty sure that between them, we can, they can come up with an answer for pretty much any question uh, about the area that you can throw at them. So it's great to have everybody joining us live for this Q&A action today. And thanks for that great presentation, that great uh, trip to the deep sea to explore off of the coast. That was awesome. Okay, well, I think we should start meeting some groups. If you're tuning in live uh, via YouTube, now's the time to use that chat sidebar, send us in a couple questions. Uh, we'll work some of those in. I'm also going to start grabbing some of our live classrooms. So I think I'll start with Ms. Brown's classroom. They're a grade seven, eight classroom. They're joining us in London, Ontario. So let's dive down and find them. There we go. How are we doing, Ms. Brown? Good. How are you? Good, good. Thanks for joining us today. Yeah, no, that was awesome. Thank you for taking us deep down in the bottom of the ocean there. That was pretty cool. All right. Well, we're ready to steal a question if you've got one for us. I'm just waiting for my class to type in the chat. Uh, maybe can you give us a few minutes and I'll just give, give, give them a second to type something and maybe back in a minute or so? Yeah, yeah. I'll swing back to your crew. Okay, perfect. Yeah, someone just typing one now. So thanks a lot. All right. Let's grab another classroom here. Let's go to Madame Fellows class. Grade three, four is joining us in Waterloo. Let's see if I can bring them in. Hey, Madame Fellows. Is 
Sometimes it takes a moment with the mutes because the classrooms are joining via. Hi, sorry, do you have my audio right now? Yeah, we've got gotcha. you. We can hear you, Madame Fellows. Hey, Joe, I've got a question you on the me? YouTube okay. chat. Uh, Madame Fellows, can you hear us now? OK, we'll, we'll come back. I can see that question as well. So let's start off with that one. This is Miss Anthony, and they're wondering uh, if the ROV is difficult to maneuver. Yeah, I'll take a step at it first. Um, it, it can be because it's it's quite large. Um, and and I, as I mentioned before, and you saw in, in that clip, um, there's a number of cameras on the left side, the right side, um, one looking down, and then you have the main camera looking forward. Um, and then you also have Argus on top that is also looking at Hercules. Um, and it can be very difficult because there's a number of environmental factors that affect how well it moves, including currents, um, a really complex 3D environment because you don't want to bump into rocks or sensitive corals and sponges. And so, but the pilots are really experienced and they did such a great job on our mission and all the other missions. Um, so it takes a team about of about three or four people to do it, but it, it can be quite difficult depending on the environmental conditions. Yeah, I could add, there's like a little bit of a lag because there's this tether that's taking it all the way down these deep sections. So whatever you, whatever maneuver you do at the surface on the ship, you have to kind of wait for the ROV to catch up. So I'm always impressed with the pilots and the way they're able to sort of stay on target and make the adjustments they need to, because sometimes they can get in tricky situations. They might run into something unusual, like a piece of fishing line or something that could, could tangle the ROV. And so they have to be able to maneuver very carefully around all of those sort of unknowns that they might um, come across while they're doing the dive. All right. Let's see if we can get uh, another camera crew going here. Let's try. Uh, Mr. Edwardson's class who are joining us, grade six is. Let's bring him in. There we go. How are we doing, Mr. Hello. Edwardson? How are you? Good. Thank you so much for having us. I have a couple of questions here for you. Uh, the first one is, we were, we're curious, when did you guys start this project? Lisa, you're muted. Oh, I'm muted? Go ahead. No, no, I, I just amused myself. So um, the Office of National Marine Sanctuaries has had this partnership with Ocean Exploration Trust for the last three years. And this isn't the first time that we've gone and done deep sea um, exploration with them. This is, I think, maybe the third or fourth year that we've done it. But I got involved um, a year in advance of this particular mission. Um, my boss said, hey, we have the opportunity to um, partner with Ocean Exploration Trust. Um, who wants to well, work on this? And I said, I do, I do. I, I have, I'm trained as a scientist, but I have not been doing science really for the last um, 10 years actively. I've been doing more policy coordination using my science background. So it was a thrill for me to get my feet wet again, if you will, even though I did not get my feet wet, and to really um, explore again and to have that excitement of exploration and discovery and and working with a team of really passionate people. So I worked on it for a year to put this together and, and it keeps on giving because we did the exploration in October and now we're still working on analyzing the data, writing reports, doing presentations like this. So this is something that that just keeps on giving and but does take a lot of preparation. Yeah, it's very it's very cool. Um, I have a couple. How long can a coral reef live for? <laughs> I'll, I'll take this one. Um, so a very long time. I think the oldest coral, like the oldest deep sea coral, it's a soft gorgonian, um, has been dated to 4,000 years old. And so because of their environment is so cold, 
and that's nutrient limited and food limited. Um, they're incredibly slow growing organisms. And so they only grow about a millimeter or two a year. Um, but because the environment is also very stable most times um, without human um, disturbance, thousands of years, hundreds to thousands of years. All right, well, Mr. Everton, we're gonna bring you back in. Uh, if we have some time closer to the end, we wanna to jump to another classroom now. I'm gonna grab, I think Ms. Brown said she was ready with her seven and eights. I think she's got a question queued up for us. Yeah, we do, sorry about that initially. Um, so two questions for you. Um, how much does it cost to both build and then maneuver the river? How's it much as it cost to build the ROV? And then- Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah the ROV, sorry. Yeah, so there are smallish ones that are between eight and $15,000, but they don't go as deep as the Hercules and the Argus. I would say those platforms we're looking at are um, probably close to a couple million dollars because of all of the systems that they have on them. I mean, you think about a remotely operated vehicle, it's basically a sled, and then you put different instruments on it depending on what you want to study. And so with this ROV, not only does it have to be able to be able to withstand those really, really deep depths, the pressure is intense at those depths. So it has to be constructed in a special way. And then you think about like the manipulator arm and um, the cameras and the collection tools and the, there's so many things that are included with that ROV because of the nature of the work that it does with exploration um, of these unknown areas in our, in our deeper parts of the ocean. Thanks. And our second question was, um, we've been looking at trawling. So it's, does trawling impact the ecosystems out where uh, your boats go into the ocean near California? I can do that. Um, yes, yes, trawling, um, if it's a bottom trawl, uh, will impact um, bottom features um here but the fishermen frequently do not want to trawl in areas where there's um uh, rocks which the corals will grow on because their nets will get snagged on it and here on the west coast we have uh, worked very closely with the fishermen and with the fishery management councils to uh, designate areas that avoid and basically ban bottom trawling over these fragile uh, coral areas. And the information that we were collecting um, on our dive is going to go to those fishery managers, which they will then share with the fishermen. And we also do this directly so that we can work with the fishing community to um, protect these places and um, avoid any impacts to them. And these places are also important to the fishermen because these we now know or we're discovering more and more that fish use these places for reproduction and so in these places other fish will uh, be um, available for them to fish into, into the future if you don't have a stock of fish to create the next generation of fish then your your fishery basically isn't thriving so we, we try to find ways to work with the fishermen and the fishery managers and councils to avoid fishing in these areas. All right, another great series of questions. This time we're gonna to go to central New York. We've got uh, Mrs. C's fifth graders hanging out with us. How are we doing, Mrs. C? Hi, we're doing pretty good. Um, this question popped up in my chat, although I did hear the answer briefly, but if you could please um, you know, explain a little bit more, why are the coral reef important? Definitely, I can, I can take that one. <clears throat> so in addition to providing 3D complex habitat, Lisa mentioned that um, fish actually use that for um, shelter and reproduction. Um, in addition, corals and sponges are filter feeders, and so they couple um, the water column processes with the benthic or the bottom communities. Um, and the corals and sponges also provide potential um, medical applications. And so I believe there are chemicals in a particular sponge that are being tested right now to treat uh, pancreatic cancer. So as we explore these areas, we could be discovering um, new biomedical compounds in addition to providing um, certain commercial fisheries that we value 
um, habitat and um, for shelter and reproduction. And so without some of these um, habitats, it's hard for those, those fisheries uh, to be thriving, like Lisa said. And so um, sustainable fishing is important. Um, and these corals and sponges and rocky habitat are really important um, for continuing those on for future generations. All right, good stuff. Another uh, great question. Thank you to our crew in central New York. I'm gonna take another little trip here. Let's go to Orchard Park. Some third and fourth graders are hanging out with us. There we go. How are we doing, Orchard Hello. Park? We're Hi. doing great. Well, I have some questions here for my three fours. Uh, the first one is, what do girls eat? I had a hard time understanding that question. Could you repeat it again? There was a little bit of an echo. What do deep sea coral eat? What are they eating? You want to take that one, Julie? Sure. Um, it's interesting because they have to, they don't move, right? They are, they're growing off the, the rocky substrate. And so they orient themselves, um, Lizzie, I believe it's perpendicular to the current. And um, what they do then is as, as uh, particulates, it could be plankton, it could be a, a, whatever's in the water column that drifts by, they can grab with their polyps and that's how they feed. So they rely on, they typically grow an area where there is current so that they could get the food brought to them. Yeah, and I'll just add quickly, unlike their shallow water counterparts, so like tropical corals, um, those have those symbionts in them, the, the plankton that helps them um, um, feed them as well. So uh, those don't, deep sea corals don't have those uh, plankton in their tissues, and so they rely solely on filter feeding to them. Okay, thank you. Do you have time for one more question or? Go for it. All right, and they also want to know, how um, big do the bubblegum coral get? How, or what's the biggest in that area that you've seen? That is an excellent question. Um, probably between three and at least three and six feet tall. Um, it's hard to say sometimes um, with the scale to the, to the ROV, things look bigger than they actually are. Um, but um, in some of those clips, I don't know if you saw that the two green dots that were um, on the screen, those are lasers that are exactly 10 centimeters apart. So we do use those um, when we post process the videos to then see um, how many of those 10 centimeters um, blocks are they. So it, it can measure size, um, but I haven't seen a report yet about how big the largest coral um, was that we came across during this mission. but. Um, I'm guessing at least five to six feet tall. So about as tall as me, I'm about six feet tall. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Thank you. And that's pretty impressive because, you know, I imagine that deep, that cold, that they're very slow growing. So to get to that size, it must have taken a really long time. Yeah. Very cool. All right. We've got some great five sixes joining us with uh, Mrs. DeCook. Uh, bring her in now. How are we doing today? How are you doing today? Good, thanks. How are you guys doing? Can you Great. Me? Great. Yeah, okay. gotcha. Um, so gotcha. I have a very specific question from one of my students. I'm not sure if you'll be able to answer it or not. What do vampire squids eat? Were you guys able to hear them? Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> um, go ahead, Lisa. Go ahead, Lisa. I was going to say, I do I not know. Say, I'm going to have to rely on my science on chat. My science chat. <laughs> They're predatory though, they're right? Predatory. So they are, they're right? So they are. I'm hearing an echo. I'm hearing an echo. So they do, so they um, do uh, feed on other feed on other small fish or invertebrates that they may encounter. Um, but it's it food is kind of far and in between from what I understand in the deep sea environment. It's not like there's schooling fish everywhere. So um, and and because it's cold, they they don't have a very high metabolism. So they can they can feed on something for a while. So. If, what I've seen that the vampire squids, they'll, they'll just grab something and that'll be their meal for a while. Yeah, I imagine they can afford to be too picky. Yeah, they're opportunistic feeders. So whatever they come across, if it fits in their mouth, they tend to go for it. And we'll see, okay. is there a question to go along with that? 
I don't think so. That was pretty specific. I have one other question was, what was your favorite animal that you have worked with or studied? I see everybody thinking right now. Thinking right now. It's hard to pick favorites. It's hard to pick favorites. I Um, so that's, that's a good question. Um, for me, for this deep sea coral exploration, I was just so, so excited to see those bubblegum coral. I have to say, I love the name. I love the color. It was really exciting to see how large of, um, specimens we found on Santa Lucia bank, because I knew in advance that we had not found any large corals in that area. So for me, that was really super exciting. And whenever I see pictures of it and I get to say bubblegum coral, that just gives me, you know, it's just thrilling. I just love saying bubblegum coral. All right, Lizzie, let's put you on the spot. <laughs> I was just thinking, I really love sea slugs. Um, <laughs> and there's a number that actually do live in the deep sea. Um, they're called nudibranchs because branchs mean like lungs and then nudie means uncovered. And so um, my favorite would be nudibranchs. And there's a few down there that are like these really cool, frilly pink colors. So those would be my favorite. It's not super exciting, but I like them. All right, Julie, everyone's getting a turn. Okay. Um, well, I'm kind of have a toss up. I actually kind of like some of the invertebrates and fish that hang out in the deep sea coral community. So I really like the little octopus that we find. Um, some, and you'll be learning more about that in the Monterey um, expedition because they found these huge aggregations of octopus. Um, so that's always fun to come across. And I really enjoy seeing um, the rockfish too, and the different types of rockfish that live there. All right, very cool. Well, I am definitely looking forward to the Monterey Bay uh, event coming up next week. I was lucky enough to be on the Nautilus when we found the octopus garden. So that was that was really cool. Um, That's fantastic. Yeah, very cool. So it'll be great to follow up on that. And I know they found the whale fall last year. So lots of great stuff to check out uh, in next week's live event. Um, I do want to check in with our class in central New York because everyone else had two questions. I just want to double check and see if Mrs. C has another one for us. Let me see. Thank you. Um, probably what what would be the the biggest coral reef is that you ever saw? How, how large? Or a sponge reef, because I know we talked about the sponge reefs today too. Right. Has there been any super giant ones that you've seen or? Yeah, that glass sponge, um, those mounds, they're, they're trying to decide whether or not, or study whether or not it's a true reef. Um, but that went on for thousands of meters. So many, many, many football uh, stadiums wide. Um, and we we didn't know it was down there. So when we came upon it, um, we tried um, after we figured out what it was to just go in one direction and see if we could come to the end of it. And after three hours, we did not. Um, the ROV moves pretty slowly, but it, it's massive. Um, so we're actually not even sure what the extent of it is because we ran out of time. Yeah, I, I, I agree with what Lizzie just said. Um, I was also part of that exploration and it just went on forever. And that is also very unexpected. I don't think um, seen um, ever before. So this is something that uh, Channel Islands will probably continue to explore and figure out how large it is, what it needs for the ecosystem. So this is a discovery that will continue to provide um, inspiration for more discovery. That's what happens when you go down. You find something that you continue to study and want to learn more about. And that's just what's so wonderful about exploration. It Absolutely. never ends. Absolutely. We always say that in science, you go in with 10 questions, you come out with 100. It's just the way it works. Lots of things to figure out and just leads to more questions and more things to try and understand. Uh, very cool. Well, I want to start off with a huge shout out to the YouTube community today. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for sending in all the great questions. Obviously, a shout out to those who are going to tune in later uh, when it works for their time zones. Thanks for joining us. Thank you to our camera classrooms. Great to have classrooms in Canada and the US joining us and sharing your awesome questions. And then what a team, Lizzie, Lisa, and Julie. Thank you so much 
uh, for taking us on a little California streaming today and taking us down into the world off the coast. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. This was fun. Thank you, everyone. This is great. All right. Well, just a reminder, we have one more event in this series. So we'll take a deep dive into the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary, May 5th at 2 p.m. Eastern. So head over to exploringbytheseat.com uh, and you can register for that one. Lots to check out in that event. For now, we are going to sign off for today. So thank you, everybody, for joining us. Thank you to our team. Uh, and I hope everyone has a great rest of the day. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.